This is section 24 of the $30,000 bequest and other stories by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The First Writing Machines From my unpublished autobiography Some days ago a correspondent sent in an old typewritten sheet, faded by age, containing the following letter over the signature of Mark Twain. Hartford, March 10, 1875 Please do not use my name in any way. Please do not even divulge that fact that I own a machine. I have entirely stopped using the typewriter, for the reason that I never could write a letter with it to anybody without receiving a request by return mail, that I would not only describe the machine, but state what progress I had made in the use of it, etc., etc. I don't like to write letters and so I don't want people to know I own this curiosity-breeding little joker. A note was sent to Mr. Clemens asking him if the letter was genuine, and whether he really had a typewriter as long ago as that. Mr. Clemens replied that his best answer is the following chapter from his unpublished autobiography. 1904. Villa Carto, Florence, January. Dictating autobiography to a typewriter is a new experience for me, but it goes very well, and is going to save time and language, the kind of language that soothes vexation. I have dictated to a typewriter before, but not autobiography. Between that experience and the present one there lies a mighty gap more than thirty years. It is sort of lifetime. In that wide interval much has happened, to the type machine as well as to the rest of us. At the beginning of that interval a type machine was a curiosity. The person who owned one was a curiosity, too. But now it is the other way about. The person who doesn't own one is a curiosity. I saw a type machine for the first time in what year? I suppose it was 1873 because Nasby was with me at the time, and it was in Boston. We must have been lecturing, or we could not have been in Boston, I take it. I quitted the platform that season. But never mind about that. It is no matter. Nasby and I saw the machine through a window, and went in to look at it. The salesman explained it to us, showed us samples of its work, and said it could do fifty-seven words a minute a statement which we frankly confessed that we did not believe. So he put his type-girl to work, and we timed her by the watch. She actually did the fifty-seven in sixty seconds. We were partly convinced, but said it probably couldn't happen again. But it did. We timed the girl over and over again, with the same result always. She won out. She did her work on narrow slips of paper, and we pocketed them as fast as she turned them out to show as curiosities. The price of the machine was one hundred and twenty-five dollars. I bought one, and we went away very excited. At the hotel we got out our slips, and were a little disappointed to find that they contained the same words. The girl had economized time and labor by using a formula which she knew by heart. However, we argued, safely enough, that the first type girl must naturally take rank with the first billiard player. Neither of them could be expected to get out of the game any more than a third or a half of what was in it. If the machine survived, if it survived, experts would come to the front, by and by, who would double the girl's output without a doubt. They would do one hundred words a minute, my talking speed on the platform. That score has long ago been beaten. At home I played with the toy, repeated and repeated and repeated, the boy stood on the burning deck, until I could turn that boy's adventure out at the rate of twelve words a minute. Then I resumed the pen, for business, and only worked the machine to astonish inquiring visitors. They carried off many reams of the boy and his burning deck. By and by I hired a young woman, and did my first dictating, letters merely, and my last, until now. The machine did not do both capitals and lower case, as now, but only capitals. Gothic capitals they were, and sufficiently ugly. I remember the first letter I dictated. It was to Edward Bach, who was a boy then. I was not acquainted with him at that time. 
his present enterprising spirit is not new he had it in that early day he was accumulating autographs and was not content with mere signatures he wanted a whole autograph letter i furnished it in typewritten capitals signature and all it was long it was a sermon it contained advice also reproaches i said writing was my trade my bread and butter i said it was not fair to ask a man to give away samples of his trade would he ask the blacksmith for a horseshoe would he ask the doctor for a corpse now i come to an important matter as i regard it in the year seventy four the young woman copied a considerable part of a book of mine on the machine in a previous chapter of this autobiography i have claimed that i was the first person in the world that ever had a telephone in the house for practical purposes i will now claim until dispossessed that i was the first person in the world to apply the type machine to literature that book must have been the adventures of tom sawyer i wrote the first half of it in seventy two the rest of it in seventy four my machinist type copied a book for me in seventy four so i concluded it was that one that early machine was full of caprices full of defects devilish ones it had as many immoralities as the machine of today has virtues after a year or two i found that it was degrading my character so i thought i would give it to howells he was reluctant for he was suspicious of novelties and unfriendly toward them and he remains so to this day but i persuaded him he had great confidence in me and i got him to believe things about the machine that i did not believe myself he took it home to boston and my morals began to improve but his have never recovered he kept it six months and then returned it to me i gave it away twice after that but it wouldn't stay it came back then i gave it to our coachman patrick mcclear who was very grateful because he did not know the animal and thought i was trying to make him wiser and better as soon as he got wiser and better he traded it to a heretic for a side saddle which he could not use and there my knowledge of its history ends end of section twenty four